Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending February 15th. First up, a lot of you have been communicating with me and asking about the Jade Rabbit, the Chinese moon rover. Um, the last word that's been heard about it is when it was, they. what they basically do is act in the uh, Twitter account that the Jade Rabbit has. They act like the Jade Rabbit's actually talking to the followers. And the last message they got just before it was to go into hibernation was it's giving its last final goodbyes. While it does look like it's actually woken up this time after the hibernation period, it, it's not dead and gone. It's actually able to communicate, it's able to receive, and it's able to transmit back. But as far as the mechanical issues, it seems like they still have those left to resolve. It's not making any signs like it's able to move around or anything like that. Um, other information from the European Space um, reporting websites and stuff like that is that they think possibly that one of the panels, one of the solar panels that's supposed to fold up to protect the craft, didn't fold up properly, so it was exposed to a little bit more cold than it normally was designed to tolerate. So, still up in the air as to whether it's going to move around and actually uh, be able to uh, do any more exploration of the moon, but still not down and out, so good for that. And this was from, I'll give you the link to the LA Times, which is one of the sites that I was checking out, but. Um, a lot of the information about it, because it's from China, I think a lot of it's just basically kept under wraps, so until they have any really major good news that it's moving again or anything like that, I don't I don't think they're going to really, really release a lot of updates. It's going to be, you know, just kind of touch and go from here on out. But, uh, you know, kudos to them. I actually hope, I mean, since we're not the ones doing it right now, we're kind of, you know, falling behind a little bit. Um, good, I hope they do actually get it um, running again and get it moving again. This next up is from 1954 Shadow. Thank you, Bob. GE and NASA to revive open rotor jet engines. Some of you maybe that have uh, followed aircraft development remember that in the 80s there was this big design change that was supposed to be great and uh, solve some of the fuel problem with jet engines where you would have external propellers. And uh, this design ended up being really good and it did what it was supposed to do. It saved about 30 to 35 percent of the fuel. But the one reason why they finally did ditch it is because of the fact of the noise level of it. It was uh, basically, uh, you know, it was just too noisy to be of practical use. It would, uh, you know, provide a less than comfortable ride for the passengers. Well, since fuel costs have been rising and rising and rising, and now with new computer designs, NASA and GE have gotten together again, and they're going to try to see if they can work on this to maybe make it possible. I mean, uh, a lot of different things you could do. Maybe uh, cut down the noise by the computer design of the blades themselves. And then with some of the new materials and stuff like that, maybe insulate the cabins a little bit more, move the engine a little bit far farther back on the airplane so that the noise isn't quite as noticeable. But yeah, now that you're talking about a 30 to 35 percent fuel cost savings, uh, this might end up being pretty good. And this website is called inventorspot.com. And uh, it's really cool. The, the basic design, I'll just give you, a, it's kind of like a, an oversimplified explanation, but um, the fuel burning itself, um, turns one of the propellers and then uh, since it's a turbine design and everything the turbine actually turns the one um, the, the fuel burning turns the one set of propellers and then the turbine itself spinning up on the exhaust gas turns the other one so you basically uh, get a double shot at using the same fuel for the same thing um, it's kind of similar to if you put a turbo on a car you know although basically it's a feedback loop but yeah basically you're uh, using some of the power in the exhaust itself to uh, instead of just uh, spewing it out the back of the airplane and everything, you're actually using it twice over to uh, spin another propeller, so get a little bit more efficiency out of it. And uh, this thing with the blade designs can go up to uh, Mach 0.75, three quarters of the speed of sound, so plenty good use. Probably not much for military use other than transport and stuff like that, but for commercial use, going to work out plenty fine. This next one is from my buddy Rob RC62, and this is from the site Naked Security. Hackers to demo a $20 iPhone-sized gadget that zombifies cars. Um, sounds scary on the face of it, and in some ways maybe it is a little bit scary, but uh, the thing about this is uh, you have to actually plug it into the uh, little connector on the bottom of your car, the little connector that um, has the diagnostic utilities and stuff like that. So to me, if somebody has basic physical access to your car, they could do a lot of things to it. I mean, even the non-computerized older cars, if you have physical access to it, you could put a little disconnect relay on the different circuits and stuff like that and kind of mess around with the cars. But um, I guess they're just demonstrating this because in the past there were uh, cars such as uh, Ford Escape 
that you could uh, basically uh, from remote control disable brakes and stuff like that and my concern is in the future when you don't have physical access to the cars and you just have a lot of features that you can uh, maybe have a little remote control device on your keychain or use your smartphone to uh, enable a lot of the features on your cars and stuff like that um, if there's not enough security basically your car is open to anybody else with uh, some good wireless hacking skills but for now this particular method that they're doing it doesn't really over concern me a lot because it does require a physical connection and uh, I think to me security is kind of like if, if you give somebody physical access to your car um, basically anything they want to do basically is, is open for the possibility if they choose to do it but um, in the future I'm more concerned actually that if you get a chance um, check out this article it gives uh, a lot of good information about some different tests they've done on different cars and next this is from my friend Mike Reed this is Torque India there's a company that is developing a bolt-on electric change-off motor for an FC16 I guess in India and South America and countries like that the Yamaha FC16 is pretty close to like a universal motorcycle with about a 150 cc engine they uh, claim that this um, particular type of bolt-on electric engine can be bolted on about four hours and just uh, and it acts like a stress member just the same as the engine too and uh, as usual I mean when you change it over to electric the performance characteristics are great your torque is great I think they have like a, a zero to 100 time of a little over eight seconds but still they have not dealt with the charging problems and that's always a problem with electric motorcycles and the range too the range is about I think they say in one of the things around approximately 70 kilometers so until you can get ranges of better than 100 miles and quick charging times even though this innovation is great of having it being able to a bolt onto a standard motorcycle rather than uh, you know uh, being, a, being a whole manufactured motorcycle itself still a little bit left to go um, if you do go to their direct website I'll give you the link to this video I would suggest going to it first if you go to their direct website for some reason they want you to uh, download again when you go to the front page of Torque Motors um, they always want you to download it. The same exact video that's on YouTube also, so that's kind of a little bit of a pain in the butt. And uh, also, um, before my last one, uh, before my last little article here, I wanted to thank everybody that has been keeping the Dumpster Divers Facebook page active. Um, if you're on Facebook, don't hesitate to join. We've got over 100 members, still staying nice and active, lots of posts of uh, gadgets and technology and stuff like that. Uh, really enjoying the activity level a lot. And we're the ones that can keep it going. You know, our interest in science and, and posting and sharing stuff is what's going to keep the website, uh, keep it going, keep it alive. And this is last up. This is from my friend Brian West. Now, this is some real heavy-duty reading if you're into some stuff uh, like I am. I do actually read science journals, and I read uh, publications and stuff like that. I'll give you the title of this just to give you an idea. It's called Acrim Total Solar Irradiance Satellite Composite Validation versus TSI Proxy Models. And it's a heavy 24 pages of reading. Um, basically what they're talking about is they're measuring the total output, the total uh, radiation output of the sun and trying to get a good modeling for doing climate studies in the future. Um, a couple of problems I have with it is they're not really good at the first part of this article of defining things. If you're somebody like me that's really into this and has been following it, you can kind of put two and two together, but um, they don't even give a really good definition of what ACRIM is, and it's actually two different things. There's actually a satellite up right now called ACRIM that is measuring solar radiation, and I can... I'll name out the thing for you in a second, but um, there have been three separate sets of satellites using the ACRIM system to measure the amount of solar output on the sun, and then they talk about another thing called the PMOD, and that is actually, um, in Switzerland, they have a place called the Physical Meteorological Observatory in Davos in Switzerland, and if you're into solar studies, you know that already, but in this article, they just mention PMOD and assume that you know what they're talking about. Um, the other thing is, this is the uh, ACRIM sat, and it's called Activity Cavity Radiometer Irradiance Monitor Satellite. And I had to look that up to be able to, I can't just roll that off the top of my tongue, but basically they're talking about the latest satellite measurements. There's a satellite up there in sun-synchronous orbit, always pointed at the sun, giving the different measurements of the radiation. And what they're doing is comparisons of the two different methods. The ACRIM is a satellite method. The PMOD is actually the studies by scientists on the ground with the through the Swiss Institute. And they're comparing this to C and make science studies and it's got all kinds of great, if you want technical jargon, you want all kinds of nice 
charts and graphs to look at and everything like that. This is a PDF file, 24 pages, and uh, yeah, some heavy reading if you like that kind of reading for, uh, for your enjoyment. I do myself, and I know some of you guys are science geeks like I can, so put your teeth around this one. It's not super, super overcomplicated. Sometimes you might have to read things a few times, but I think you'll catch on to it, too. Um, some of them aren't necessarily easy for me, but that's part of the challenge, too. So anyway, that's it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.